Text Talks. Hi, everyone. This mini lecture is on samsara. Now, samsara is a term that is very central to the Buddhist tradition. Um, but it's also worth noting that it's a term that we find in Hindu sources as well. In today's mini lecture, however, I want to talk about samsara in mainly early Buddhism. Now, the literal meaning of samsara means to wander through or to flow on. And um, the most general meaning of samsara that you find in Buddhist sources is referring to the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. So one of the ways in which I think that it's helpful to think of samsara is as a circle or as a wheel that is constantly revolving. And um, but it's also important to know that samsara uh, has a number of slightly different connotations, even though these connotations are very much overlapping ones. So as referring to the cycle of birth and death and rebirth, we can see that samsara is also very closely related to the theory of karma. And so samsara refers to being sort of trapped into this vicious cycle of birth and death and rebirth. Now, samsara is often said to be characterized by the three marks of existence. Now, I'll talk about the three marks of existence in a different mini lecture. But just very briefly, the three marks of existence are impermanence, suffering, and not self, or not having no essence. So in other words, samsara is characterized by things always changing. Nothing is permanent. Nothing remains the same. Nothing has this sort of inherent nature. And as a consequence of that, it, um, especially for sentient beings, produces suffering. Um, and we'll get into that in another mini lecture as to why the impermanence and not self um, produces suffering. But another way to think about samsara is that, that samsara, if we want to think of the sort of law or physics of samsara, um, we can think of dependent origination. And dependent origination is the idea that things are constantly changing. Every cause has multiple effects. Nothing exists on its own. And so I think that it's really important to think of all of these things together when we think about samsara as not only referring to, um, to this cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, but this entire cycle um, basically operating according to the, um, to the doctrine of dependent origination, and that all beings who are trapped in this cycle are characterized by these three marks of existence. Now, another way to think about samsara, and again, it, it's, it's, it's related to everything that I've just said, and that is as the opposite of nirvana. So whereas nirvana is a state of being that, um, which is beyond suffering, samsara is everything else. So in other words, every, every moment of your life, every moment of everybody you know um, in their lives, unless you know some, you know, Buddhists who claim to be enlightened, all of our everyday existence is operating within samsara. Now, um, that's basically 
enough um, in terms of defining what samsara is. Now I just want to introduce you to some sources. Because as you know, when you're taking your GCSE and A-level exams, you're often asked to be able to defend your answers through source material, through primary sources, through the text. And so there are a number of texts which I think can help you understand samsara and perhaps give um, um, textual passages to defend um, the way that you discuss samsara. Now, one group of texts that is particularly helpful when thinking about the cycle of birth and death and rebirth are a group of texts called the Jatakas. The Jatakas are some of the most popular stories amongst Buddhists, um, not only in ancient India, but also today in Sri Lanka and in Southeast Asia. So in other words, those places where Theravadan Buddhism is the main for form of Buddhism, the Jatakas are very popular stories. And the Jatakas are the stories of the Buddha's previous lives. And some of the main themes, obviously, in these stories are karma and rebirth. So in other words, um, because the Jatakas all um, are about former lives of the Buddha himself, they all reinforce this cyclical understanding of samsara, um, which means that the Buddha, as well as everybody else, has a series of previous lives. Now, another text that might be helpful in understanding the um, uh, understanding samsara is a text in the Diga Nikaya. And this is called the Mahasati Patana Sutta. And that's often translated as the discourse on mindfulness. Now, I'm sure a number of you, as you've been studying Buddhism, have come across this term mindfulness. Mindfulness is a, a type of meditation that's very popular today um, in the West as well as in Buddhist countries. And this text is one of the oldest sources for mindfulness meditation. It is the 22nd sutta in the collection of suttas called the Diga Nikaya. And in the supplementary slide, um, I have a, um, um, a link so you can, you can get access to the Diga Nikaya online. Um, and as I said, that it's this sutta that's the foundation of modern meditation, I mean, modern mindfulness, or what's called vipassana practice. Now, one of the things that this sutta talks about is how to meditate, including breathing exercises and postures. But this sutta also contains some of the core teachings um, that characterize samsara. So, for example, when it comes to um, the three marks of existence, um, it has a very um, interesting and, you know, rather morbid section about meditation um, in the cremation grounds, which is basically um, a meditative exercise on impermanence. So um, we might think that as an example of the first mark of existence. Um, it also um, has a version of the Four Noble Truths. So in that way, this sutta um, represents the second mark of existence, suffering, because the Four Noble Truths starts with the First Noble Truth of suffering. Um, and also, it contains a teaching of the five khandhas, um, which we might see as a way of explaining the third mark of existence, um, not self. So in that way, um, you might look at the Mahasati Patanasutta 
as a, a good resource for um, coming up with examples of the three marks of existence as a way of understanding samsara. Another sutta, also in the Diga Nikaya, this is the 15th sutta in the Diga Nikaya, is called the Maha Nidana Sutta, which is the great discourse of origins. And this sutta gives the fullest treatment in the early sources on the doctrine of dependent origination. So if you're looking for any textual references to talk about um, dependent origination, this is a good sutta to look at. This is also a sutta that goes, um, that has an extensive discussion about um, not self. So um, you could also look at this sutta for that. But again, because these doctrines are part of characterizing samsara, um, you can look at this sutta as a way to help understand um, help you understand samsara. But now I just want to bring attention to one more source, um, a very interesting one for understanding samsara. And this is um, the philosophy of one of Buddhism's most famous philosophers, um, a figure by the name of Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna lived between about 150 and 250 in the Common Era. Um, he's one of the most important philosophers in the Buddhist tradition. Um, we don't really know much about his, his life, but um, the, many scholars think that he was um, born into a high caste Brahmin family and that he was from somewhere in the south of India. One of the interesting things about Nagarjuna's philosophy is that he challenged many of the established interpretations of the Buddha's teachings. Now, on the one hand, um, Nagarjuna didn't claim to come up with anything new. He claimed that all his teachings, all his philosophy was firmly based on the words of the Buddha, um, and so that therefore he was merely um, conveying uh, the wisdom of the Buddhist tradition. However, um, he was a very innovative and in some ways a rather um, revolutionary philosopher, one who challenged a number of norms because he argued that a number of the ways in which the Buddhist teachings were normally interpreted ha were basically wrong, were off the mark, had misunderstood things that the Buddha was trying to say. And so in his time, and even to um, people coming across Nagarjuna for the first time who know something about Buddhism, some of his philosophy sounds a bit provocative, sounds a bit surprising. Now, one of his most famous quotations is about samsara. And in his famous book, the Mula Madhyamika Karika, he says, there is nothing that distinguishes samsara from nirvana. There is nothing that distinguishes nirvana from samsara. And the furthest limit of nirvana is also the firmest, furthest limit of samsara. Not even the subtlest difference between the two is found. Now, if we were in a classroom setting, I wouldn't try to tell you what this passage meant. Instead, I would ask for students to try to respond. Um, in this sort of um, setting, um, where we can't do it that way, I will give you a little bit of um, my interpretation of what he means by this. Um, we can certainly see that this sounds pretty shocking. Um, you know, as I started out, one of the ways in which most Buddhists understand samsara is as the opposite of nirvana. So how could it be possible that Nagarjuna is basically arguing that there's no difference between them at all? 
Now, I think one of the ways to understand what Nagarjuna is saying here, probably not the only way, but certainly one of the ways, is that he's bringing attention to the fact that nirvana is not a realm. It's not a place. So in other words, I think a lot of Westerners in particular understand nirvana as some sort of Buddhist equivalent of heaven. But I think that what we can see, what we can learn from this quotation from Nagarjuna, is that it would be wrong to think of it that way. In other words, nirvana isn't some realm or a place that one can um, ascend to um, once one becomes enlightened. Rather, according to this understanding of nirvana, nirvana is a state of mind. It's a way of looking at things, not a physical destination. And so I think looking at it that way, we can see that um, there's no difference between samsara and nirvana because nirvana is not some place that we're going to go when we die, some realm that's up in the heavens, but rather um, nirvana is attainable here and now in this life. Um, in exactly the same physical location where samsara is, um, but rather um, for attaining it, um, we need a radically different perspective on our lives and um, and you know our, our everyday interactions with people. So I'll let you contemplate that um, quotation further. Um, and come up with possibly some of your own understandings of what Nagarjuna means by this. Um, I'll leave it here for now. I've also included in the supplementary PowerPoint presentation um, some sources for further reading, um, both primary sources and secondary sources. So thank you very much, and I look forward to next week's mini-lecture on Buddhism.